Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. My name is Shaw, and I'm an alcoholic. It's so fancy. <laughs> I want to thank Cassie for asking me to speak because it is always a privilege and honor to speak in any meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous, actually any 12-step. It's, uh, it's a good deal. I, um, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. It's probably a good time to speak because my life is just kind of chaotic, but I don't know. My sobriety date is June 16, 1996. I have a sponsor. I have sponsees. And um, I'm doing my best to maintain an active social life. But AA keeps getting in the way. <laughs> so, uh, you know, like, here, actually, Alcoholics Anonymous right now is just kind of annoying to me. And um, I think it's normal. I remember when I would see other people with, with more time than me not being as thrilled about Alcoholics Anonymous as being, like, ungrateful. Like, you have all this life, and I'm, and now I understand it. One thing that I do know for certain, that once you get on the spiritual path, if you judge it, it will be you soon. So every time I judged anybody in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous, it has become me later on. And, um, and I guess I had it really hard for people that... Um, <coughs> just weren't always living in the lap of gratitude for um, from whence they came to where they are. I mean, I definitely have a... I came in with, like, 20 teeth and a backpack and a pair of chucks and a pair of dogs, and I was about to be evicted. It was very chaotic and really, really dramatic. Today, the drama is very different. Um, I honestly feel everything a lot more than I did in the beginning. Um, because I've, like, thought out... And the staying sober is an educational process. I'm not one of those people that is ever going to say that I'm, I've been here for like 23 years and I've learned nothing. It's not true. I didn't know it was the first drink that got me drunk. That was like, that was like, what? Oh my God. It just blew my mind. And so I've stayed here and I've worked the steps and I've worked them with other people and I've learned a lot more. And, uh, it's not always delicious. Um, but, being sober means the lights are on. Like, there's nowhere to run, there's nowhere to hide. And I'm not going to implode. And thus far, my God has yet to drop me on my ass. Even when I feel like it's just shaky. Um, I was thinking the other day how, this is my poor, poor me. <clears throat> it's in less than two years, less than two years, my stepmother died. I had one surgery on this shoulder, then I had another surgery on this shoulder. I got kidney stones. My dad used to live in paradise. He lost his home. My mom's Alzheimer's dementia got really progressive. We finally got her to have an MRI. They said it was a mass. There was a mass there. And then we had to wait like two and a half weeks for them to tell us that the mass wasn't going to kill her. That's That was, you know, I wanted to fight that share because it was very dramatic. Like, my mom has a brain mass, and I don't know what to do. And then it turned out to not be dramatic. Um, uh, It's just her Alzheimer's and dementia is just progressing. And um, and my father went from home to no home to hotel, and now he's, like, in a FEMA trailer. And he just had hip surgery done the other day. And my nephew, who had had been diagnosed with a, a blood clot earlier this year, decided to stop taking the Eliquis because he felt better. And, the, and um, so he had a clot in his sleep, and he died. He was, like, 27. Like, he... Like, nothing. This kid did nothing. And um, me, I do everything, and then I make it to AA. And I have this, like, great life. So there was that. I don't know. Did I, and then I had kidney stones. Like, all kinds of shit happened, and, like, not even... A year and a half. And I thought, that is a considerable amount. And it makes me want to just sort of disconnect from life. Um, yeah, and I'm, I'm out of work. I've been looking for work technically since May. And um, 
it's just been kind of challenging. So when I go to AA and I hear things that I don't feel are worthy, <laughs> or um, I've, en I've endured, I've listened to a lot of gossip in the past like two years, and a lot of it about myself. Things, yeah, things that were like, I was truly struggling to for air, and I'd come to an AA meeting, and somebody would ask me something that was just, it was so ridiculous. I couldn't believe they were actually asking me that. And I'd like to turn my back on AA, but I cannot. And if you're in Alcoholics Anonymous, you cannot either. I've not seen anybody turn their back on AA and totally come up. They They might stay sober, but they just don't come up. And I've seen people that I really thought, like, were the ones, the ones that broke free of, like, working the steps and going to meetings. They turned their back on AA, and their lives, like, exploded for the better. And then it caught fire and burned to the ground, and they ended up coming back to AA anyway. And I, I'd rather just stick it out. And, um, and that's kind of like where I'm at today. I'm just sticking it out. I know things like this too shall pass and that my primary purpose is just to work with somebody else. And um you know, and it would just be a little easier to breathe. So I have a sponsor tomorrow at one o'clock. That's it. Thank you. I'm Laura, I'm an alcoholic. Hey, Laura. Um thank you, Shaw for that. Um, there is a thing in there that, that reminded me of, of when I got sober, I thought that the worst days were behind me mm -hmm. um, and that I, uh, it was all going to be on the up and up from here on out and that I, I would not have to deal with life on life's terms anymore that I was going to be somehow absolved from that because I got sober and it was such, uh, uh, the things that I've stayed sober through at this point, I feel the same way of just like, I don't want, I don't want to ever go out cause I never want to be new again. Cause it sucks. Welcome new person. Um, <laughs> and, uh, but also the things that I've stayed sober through, I didn't think anyone could stay sober through it. When I was going through them, I did not think I could stay sober through them. And now that I have, there's such a sense of um, um, peace around, I'll never, I'll never not be an alcoholic, but there's peace around the fact that I can survive a lot without a bottle, which is just not something I knew how to do for a long time. So um, a little bit about me. Uh, I just had my 11th sober birthday last week on October 15th. Um, and I have a sponsor. I've had the same sponsor uh, for a while, and I'll talk about her later. And because uh, we have we have 40 minutes together. So I'm going to I'm going to share so much. I was thinking today, I was like trying to remember like enough of my drunk -a log that I could make this a Saturday night share, you know? Because it's like you got to have some, like, some zippy stories in there, too. It can't just be all recovery on a Saturday night. It's got to be a little dirty. <laughs> um, so for, for those of you who are new to um, people who speak aren't spokespeople for AA. We don't have any um, bosses in AA, which is really nice. And so if you don't hear something from me that works for you, go to another meeting. But you probably will because I'm a major people pleaser. <laughs> and I'm going to be scanning all of your faces for approval throughout this and making sure that we're connecting and that I'm, my <laughs> jokes are landing. And so, um, and that's something that I discovered in my, uh, during my step work that became apparent to me and that I get to now work on for the rest of my life. So, um, awareness, acceptance, action. So, um, I was born a young alcoholic baby on the south side of Chicago, <laughs> which is like being born, um, uh, like if you love hockey, it's like being born in Canada, or like if you're, I don't know, like, I don't know if you love pasta, because these are stereotypes, but they were probably true. Um, so, I was born in this place where the coolest thing you could be 
is a fall down drunk man. <laughs> um, and luckily for me, until I was got sober, I saw myself as a fall down drunk man. So um, I thought I was pretty hip too. Um, there's this Irish tradition where when a, a baby is born, you wet the baby's head. You wet the baby's head by having a kegger to uh, initiate this baby into the world. So when my mother brought me home from the hospital, the, I, the kegger was in full swing. Um, there was people passed out all over my house. My dad had thrown a, a nice three-day party while my mom was in the hospital recovering. And it was on. Um, so it in Irish, and I don't know in, in all Irish Catholic communities, but in, in Chicago, it's... Um, there's a lot of socializing that goes on for families of, in you know, kids, parents, grandparents, everyone in the bars. Um, there's no, like, they don't not let you into a bar if you're with your parents. So um, I spent a lot of time growing up with my parents in bars doing traditional Irish things like uh, playing darts and um, <laughs> um, learning how to perfectly pour beers and things like that and political organizing and all, you know, learning about folk music and shit, the, you know, the ways we excuse um, hardcore drinking. It's like we're listening to traditional Irish, Irish music, you know. It's so funny. It's like how people are into wine. It's like their hobby is wine, and I'm just like, you're drunk. So your hobby is you're a drunk. But um, there's that judgment you were talking about. Um, so, um, and I loved it there. I love bars. Like, my natural habitat is a dive bar um, with some, like, George Thorogood on the jukebox and, like, shitty beer. Um, that's just my natural milieu. Um, I love talking shit with people. I love, um, banter. Um, I love empty, shallow relationships and, uh, bar met all those needs really young. My parents split up, obviously, uh, cause why would that relationship work out? And, um, my dad, uh, who is my alcoholic soulmate. I love drinking with my father. My dad um, used to take me on visitation. Then we could just go to bars all the time. Uh, just two guys hanging out, going to the bars. And there was this one, I was having, I was thinking and having this memory today. Uh, does anyone remember the Bozo Show? Okay, the Bozo Show was this creepy-ass public access show with these, <laughs> these clowns, uh, these Chicago clowns who would do games with children. And there was a, a magician clown. Yeah, he had this terrifying hair. Um, and the magician clown on that show also ran a bar in Chicago that was a magician bar. So when my mom would yell at my dad for taking me to the bar, he would say, no, 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 I'm taking her to the magician bar. <laughs> Those of you with young female children, can you think of any more horrifying thing than, like, your daughter going to a magician bar? Um, but... Uh, so I'd go to the magician bar, and I'd see magic tricks, and I'd play piano. I'd practice my piano there. I'd bring my, my music lessons, and I'd practice there. And the guys would clap for me, and I was in heaven. And so uh, I could not wait until I could be an adult man uh, drinking. Um, and I saw it very clearly. I'd come home from my union job. And then, you know, would, like, um, lie to my wife, and then I'd go to the bar and drink, and we could talk about what bitches and our women were and how awful they were to us and how they were trying to control our drinking and shit. And, um, and we'd never go to AA because the AA was for quitters. And only people uh, who go to AA are people who can't handle their, their alcohol like us and who, um, uh, who get DUIs because then you have to do it for the judge. I picked up a lot of really good information here. Um, also, you never have emotions. Emotions are for pussies. Uh, emotions are for pussies unless, like, Springsteen comes on the jukebox. And then you cry out of control. Just, like, out of control weeping. But that's cool. That's manly because that's about, like, the love between, like, brothers. Um, and I got it. I got I was recording everything. So by the time my high school career hit, I knew the score. Um, I'm blessed with a flak jacket-like liver that can just absorb 2.3% alcohol beer at a rate far exceeding my height and weight. And um, there was all sorts of things that I did not want to do and that I wasn't really ready to. I didn't have a lot of emotional tools, obviously. 
So I'm starting high school. I've, I've gotten drunk a few times with like my girlfriends and stuff. I'm ready to do this. I know that at some point I'm going to have to give a, a blowjob. And I'm like terrified about this whole thing. This like, this looms large in my life. Like, oh God, I'm going to have to like suck up the penis in my mouth at some point. And so, um, other things too, you know, like the first failures, like having crushes that don't pan out, all these things that are really difficult. Um, popularity and like dealing with girlfriends, a really great way to get through all of that is just to be on the verge of blackout drunk the entire time. <laughs> and so, um, I used alcohol in order to deal with all those things. I um, didn't just use alcohol to avoid emotions. So although uh, that's a great way, that's a great reason to be an alcoholic. You have a bunch of emotions you want to avoid. Um, that's super cool. That's what I use Netflix for now. <laughs> the, um, but there was other things too. You know, I had old emotions from the past to deal with I didn't want to deal with. Then there's just the fact that, like, I love the way that alcohol makes me feel. All of a sudden, I have no fears, no social anxiety, um, and I feel a closeness with my peers that I don't just naturally feel in life. Like, when you watch beer commercials, there's a version of adulthood where everybody's having a good time and fe seemingly very comfortable with each other. And I just don't quite feel that because, like, you know, not everybody, first of all, I don't even think you should feel that way is something I know now. Like, not everybody's your fucking friend. You don't have to like everybody. Not everyone's going to like you. But you wouldn't know that from watching, you know, Budweiser commercials where life is just one big fucking volleyball game. And um, I desperately wanted to, for things to all be okay. And so drinking gave me the space to have the illusion that everything is just okay and I'm fine and everything's fine. Um, then there was this other weird aspect of drinking that started to creep in, which was this like weird quest for God that I think like, as I think about it was just kind of me co-signing my own bullshit that like, you know, it was kind of like my, my Jim Morrison years of drinking and drug use where I was like, I'm going to like expand my mind with this shit too. And you know, what I'm trying to get at is, like, alcohol filled a lot of, uh, ticked a lot of boxes for me. There was a lot of things that I found that I could do with it. Um, it made me smarter, prettier, sexier, better at giving these blowjobs that I didn't want to give at all. It was like, how many blowjobs do I have to give for them to not say I'm a lesbian? It was like three to, like, the braggiest boys in school, and then I'm like off the hook for the rest of high school. <laughs> yes, actually, that was the, that three was the magic number. So, um, yeah, it was like, high school fucking sucks, man. Um, anyway, so I went to college, and uh, all throughout this time, too, I'm still drinking with my family. All, uh, all my family has bars in their basements, and um, it's really fun. And it's like kind of a fun aspect of Irish life, like where you get home from work and you go down into your basement bar and like you and the wife have like cocktail hour in the basement, um, you know, and then get blackout and pee on your own front yard. But up until then, it's really fun. And um, I really enjoyed I The time where I did feel close and feel a part of was when I was getting hammered with my family. And that was something um, that, to this day, I still miss. I still miss the kind of closeness and uh, family bonding time that we have that I'm no longer a part of. It is, like, it is something that I lost in this process that um, is sad. I wish that I could have both still, you know? Um, so anyway, now I'm off to college. I'm going to find God uh, by doing acid every day for a right year. Right, right? It was a fucking dope idea. And it was so it was so great. I had so many great ideas once I got to college. I went to college in Appalachia, which like I thought I was a, I thought I was a badass drinker because of where I was from. But then I met fucking Southerners, you know, and Southerners party and they all had pills like they were all huge pill people and it wasn't like the raver or like the raving the raving days of yore um <laughs> and uh so it's so i mean it was like everything started off great and went downhill really quick um doing acid every day for a year is not a good idea um those kids had moonshine and that was when i first understood you could drink yourself blind 
uh, I had never done that before, but you could actually drink yourself blind for a weekend. Holy shit. I would wake up half in and half out the crick, like E.T., you know, when they see E.T., <laughs> and he's just, like, kind of all white and pasty, and Elliot's going over the bridge. Like, that was me. Um, that shit was foul, but I loved it. I was like, oh, my God, I can lose not just days, but whole weekends. <laughs> and then, like, more than that, like, oh, God. Because at some point, like, there was some self-loathing that started to creep in right around 19. Um, all of a sudden, I didn't feel great about myself anymore. And no matter how much I drank, I couldn't get back to those initial kind of like glory days of my drinking where it made me feel strong and brilliant and uh, amazing. I would wake up in the morning and feel like the sense of demoralization. And so I'd just stick a tab of ecstasy up my ass. So I, and then go to school uh, because then I was like, oh, okay, the feeling will go away. Um, I did so many weird and uh, unsavory things then for the next several years. It was like I became a true garbage can uh, uh, kind of alcoholic and drug addict. I'd have these phases, um, and that's how I kind of think about 18 to 26. There were the raw ether years. Those are just a blur, as you could imagine. Um, trying to sell raw ether is a tricky business, um, by the way. <laughs> Trying to obtain and then trying to sell raw ether to other people for huffing is a tricky business. If you think about it, those of you who've sold drugs in the past, how exactly do you monetize a, a liquid like that? I really struggled. Um, <laughs> and because then I was like, do I or they would, uh, Amazon wasn't a thing yet. Now what, what I would do is I would just order small, smaller bottles off of Amazon and have them sent to my house. But such a service did not exist at the time. And so what I would do is just, I would just give people my address, and then I'd say, BYO rag. And I would soak your rag for you for $5. And then you could go walk back to whatever fucking hole you crawled out of with your rag to, to suck on. Um, those were good. You can imagine the winners who woke up in my bed during those years, just like the bizarro thing, right, Tammy? Those were some lookers, right? Uh, um, those were strange days. Um, da, 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 da. Those were also the years, too, when, like, the consequences started piling up, too. Like, everyone was going to jail. Um, not me. I'm, like, you know... I, I mean, and part of it is, you know, the package that I come in, right? Like, no one thinks the Martha Stewart-looking chick has got, like, you know, a closet full of raw ether. Um, but I did. Um, but just, like, things started to get really uh, not as much fun anymore. Um, a bunch of my uh, cousins went to jail around that time for not unrelated, um, for bank robbery. And um, my family members started dying around this time as well. Um of alcoholism and the things that go along with it. And the you, I knew that this was, I knew that the party was over. They still don't know the party is over, anyone that I'm related to, but I knew the party was over very long before I stopped. It was like, oh, God, we're, we are killing ourselves. Um, this is terrible. Um, and then I did the thing that was in the reading where it's like, okay, so obviously ether is part of the problem, um, followed by, um, all of this cocaine. Like, so I'm just going to do, just going to drink beer. Well, no, beer's the issue. I'm just going to do the cocaine again because I should get my college degree. Um, but you know what? Actually, the study drugs they give teenagers now are almost better than the cocaine. So I'm just going to do that. Oh, shit, I weigh 80 pounds. Like, oh, God, oh, God. Um, and on and on like that, trying to find the magic solution. I went to, like, you know, I'm, I lived in, like, uh, four or five different states in a couple-year period. I lived uh, I lived in a tent for a long time, not because I didn't have a job, but because I was, like, having a Walden period. Aren't, like, the looking back, aren't, the, aren't the teens in early 20s, when you look back at it, just, like, excruciatingly embarrassing? It's like, I don't want to go back to those things, not because of the alcoholism, just because of the pretentiousness. Where it's just like, oh, God, you're just a humiliate. No wonder you drank. You were so embarrassing. Um, and... Um, yeah, um, so what happened? Um, I finally moved to California because California is where healthy people live. There was that show, The O.C. Um, <laughs> they all looked like they were um, healthy, red-blooded American kids, and I was going to get clean and sober in Los Angeles, juice cleanse, 
yoga <laughs> things, right? These are things that if you all you have to do is move there, and then the city will take care of the rest. And it does not. It doesn't. Um, it doesn't. So after about a year of waking up on bus stops with weirdos' hands in my shirt, I decided to eleven years ago start to get try to get sober. Um, um, my dad, who who lived, I just saw him today. Um, he, um, two of my favorite uncles died one right after the other, and I had to clean up their houses, which was like a scared straight program. We do not die, um, like you know, like you know, like Lord Byron, or like you know, like you're having like a beautiful alcoholic death where you're just like maybe laying and like you have like a very pretty open shirt, and then you just kind of like demise like that's not the velvet. and you're gorgeous and there's velvet and there's roses and there's nymphs <laughs> none of that my one, my uncle's esophagus disintegrated over the course of about three months and um it is terrible and his ass was beautiful he's he was beautiful um he was my hero growing up and watching him turn from um you know, this gorgeous, you know, like, one, you know, my hero to his, the reason I was there cleaning his house is because his kids fucking hated him, you know? All of his shit went into a dumpster. They thought that he had been murdered because there were so many blood sprays all over. It looked like arterial blood sprays, but it was his whole fucking throat had disintegrated and he sp- uh, spat it up. Um, it was heartbreaking. It's really hard to do something like that and then go back to what we do. You know, I couldn't, it was all, it it was like a full, is is that, is that PTSD? Is that what I'm describing? Where it's like you're, you, I would drink and then I would just like immediately puke. And then my dad went into the hospital for a similar thing and he was kind of on life support for a few days. And that was when I ended up getting sober. I was just like done, um, which is really ironic. You know, at the time I was like, um, when I started coming in the rooms and I was hearing about these consequences, I was like, well, I never had any consequences. I mean, I saw consequences happen to other people and that's why I stopped. Right. But of course I had consequences. It's like the first time, uh, the first time I ever got really blackout drunk, I got sexually assaulted. But of course that's not the way that I framed it at the time. To me, that was just dating. That's just what I categorized as dating until I was about two years sober, you know, I had no idea the trauma that I was putting myself through by being, uh, by doing, by living the life that I was living, you know? Um, so I'm 26 years old, which at the time felt like a million years old. And I was like ready to start to do this. And so I started going to AA meetings because it was the only thing I knew. Although I was very sensitive about joining cults because I had accidentally joined not one, but two cults <laughs> while I was living in Appalachia. Um, and the weird rituals were not deal breakers for me. I quit both of them when they, when I was like, yeah, and you have to have sex with this man over 30. I was like, ew, no, I'm out. You know, it's like, oh, as this precious teenage child that I was. Um, so I didn't want to join a cult. AA is a cult. I'd heard about that in the bars. AA is a cult. They, they're after your shit. They're going to make you believe in God. Um, and so I went to something called SOS, which is the secular organization for the sobriety, which is some group in AA that I found that was not AA. And I went for about a month and it was a bunch of Wiccans that were wasted, like just (laughs) wasted. It was super, it was like, they were hot. Like they had cool, they all looked like, um, Kate Bush. It was super, but after about a month, it got, was like, okay, this isn't doing it. And so I went to AA and, um, I went in very certain that somebody, the boss or the mayor, would inform me, you are in the wrong place, young, beautiful woman. Now leave and go and enjoy your drinking. You're fine, you know? And no one, of course, said that because um, I, I looked like um, I, I was not looking good. Um, and I was weeping all the time, and I clearly needed to be there. So... Um, I went to my first home, the meeting that I went to first was called Hollywood Young Peoples. And somebody at my office, uh, yeah, uh, someone at my office uh, in L.A. had told me, go there, ask for this guy, T-Bone, um, <laughs> and uh, tell T-Bone to invite you over for dinner. And I was like, this 
there, nothing sketchy about this at all. <laughs> this sounds great. Um, and I went, and I walked into a room of people that, you know, looked a lot like, you know, people in this room. Um, people, like, they have, like, the light on inside of them. Um, and then, but then also it was Hollywood, so everybody was like, you know, like, just, <laughs> there was a lot more lip injections in that room than there is in this room. Um, and uh, they were fucking cool. Like, the, just the whole vibe of the space was kind of cool. It was not what I was expecting at all. I realized that I wanted to be friends with these people, and then immediately was like, oh, I hate these people. All these people need to die. Fuck these people, and I'm out. And that was the game that I played in the rooms for about the next three, four months, was like, here I am. I need to get sober. Also, I hate you. Also, I forgot. I remember I'm actually fine now. <laughs> I'm just overreacting. No, you're overreacting. Now I'm o- and I'm out. Um, <laughs> this woman came up to me and was like, uh, would you like me to be your temporary sponsor? And I was like, I don't... Uh, fuck women anymore, Uh, so no, please go away from me, I'm not interested in your phone number, whatever your game is, and she's like, no, no, I want to be your sponsor, and I'm like, sure, lesbo, you know, like, everyone wants to fuck me, obviously, Um, that's what this is all about, that's the only offer, that's the only value I bring to the world, so that must be what you're asking me for, and, you know, deuces, so she's been my sponsor now for 11 years, and we've had um, a lovely... Um, open relationship uh, uh, ever since. Um, and it's so interesting. Um, she had, a, I think, two years sober at the time, which seemed like a, a lie, a delusional lie she was telling herself. Because who has two years? Nobody. Um, and uh, we began working the steps together. Like I was like, okay, I'll do maybe one a year. Um, <laughs> And she said all sorts of really, really crazy things to me. She was like, you know, a sponsor is someone who takes you through the steps. Like, are you willing to go to any lengths to stay sober? And I was like, no. And then she was like, okay, well, call me when you are. And I was so, you know, desperately lonely. So I was like, oh, I mean, yes, you know. Um, I... uh, what else did she say? She had all sorts of like great little rules for me, um, and none of them I wanted to do. She was like, you know, don't date. Try not to date in the first year. And I was like, you know, that might be easy for you, aged crone that you are at 29. <laughs> but I'm like young and sexy. Like I, I'm going to, I'm going to fuck all these people in this room, you know. Um, and so I did, and that turned out awesome. Um, no. Uh, there's a the saying in AA like the odds are good but the goods are odd. AA, have you ever heard that one? So like, um, have you guys? Maybe you've heard this one. Like, wow, you you only have ten days, but it's like you have ten years. Like you're 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 so together for only ten days. And I was like, really? I am. Like, <laughs> all you needed to do was like tell me. I was like, my, like feel like, wow, you've buttoned your shirt and tied your shoes today. Like you're really. <laughs> Killing it, man. You're like, oh, do you want me to sit on your face? <laughs> um, like, cool. Um, so, yeah, so that was like a rough time. Um, because, of course, like something, you know, and it's, it's Saturday night, so let's go there. You know, they know, I'd never had sex sober before. I had no idea there was like nerve endings down there or anything. So the first time I had sex with someone sober, I was like, oh my God, are you Jesus? Like, what the fuck? <laughs> and he wasn't. He was some crazy person with 10 years who was willing to sleep with a brand new person. So we got engaged. <laughs> right? Because that's what happens when you like ha- have an orgasm for the first time sober. You're like, I'm going to lock this up. And that ended in tears, of course, because that's what happens uh, when you're brand new because you're growing. Growing and I was growing and changing, and in a few months I had seen that this was not the best idea. And then I had a mess that I had to clean up that I got to deal with in my steps. So, you know, yay there. Um, but of course, you know, like, I would not, there was no way I would have, on the flip side of that, it's like looking back at it, for a while I was judging myself on it, and I probably shouldn't have done it. I probably should have listened to somebody, but like, I couldn't make a hard zag from the zig I was on. I couldn't go right from the life I was living to being like, okay, well now I just close my legs and don't drink and 
just sit <laughs> patiently doing step work. Like it took a long time for that to kind of uh, turn around. So what else happened in that first year sober? Because it, it wasn't easy. Like uh, um, somebody told me, you know, if you're not, you keep saying you're not an alcoholic, why don't you do some controlled drinking? I was like, yeah, that sounds good. <laughs> controlled drinking. So you just have like, two drinks a day and that's it and you neither you, if you uh can just do two drinks and it's no big deal you just control it then you're not an alcoholic well that's easy enough so i woke up the next morning and i had my two drinks immediately upon waking like i always <laughs> had and then uh, was just like ah. and then, like i'm going to go for a hike and i came out of a blackout like 10 hours later and i was in my living room there was someone balled up in the corner asleep that i couldn't see who they were I was wearing a fur outfit that I'd never seen before. That I had, there was, it was made into cutoffs and cutoffs. And there were scissors on the table and then just a pile of discarded animal fur over there. I had a beer in my hand. I had a cigarette in my fingers and like one in the ashtray. There was a horror movie on with the sound off and then like some other music on really loud. And I was just like dancing. <laughs> and I had, I came to, and I'm seeing body first, scissors, cigarettes, and I was just like, you were going to control your drinking. <laughs> and I had this moment of clarity. I was like, girl, this is it. Like, this is it. And I put down that drink. I have not had a drink in uh, 11 years. That was it for me. Um, so I started seeing, like, once it was clear to me that this was, like, a real thing, there is no other place for me to go. The party has ended. I really committed myself to getting sober and did the steps shittily. Um, did the steps a lot like how I did my first confession where uh, in Catholic school. I got so nervous that I just made up a bunch of lies to the priest. <laughs> and, um, I just kind of like I got like performance anxiety. And I, I got the same thing with my fourth and fifth step. Um, uh, well, first of all, like one, two, and three... Yeah, like doing that controlled drinking experiment, although probably not the best way to do it, really did kind of prove to me that I'm, I'm powerless over this thing. I believed it after that. Um, two and three, I actually don't have a problem with a higher power. I'm, I'm what I, I'm, I love the whole higher power aspect of it. Once I found that you could just kind of offload, um, large chunks of things that, that I had to control, I could hand them over to a higher power. Like that's a pretty awesome, thing um and i have bad self-esteem so i i'm fine with somebody else uh the idea that somebody else has a better idea on how to live my life than i do i'm actually quite quite cool with that um and i like uh too you know through the 11th step the prayer and meditation step it's like my spiritual life the thing that i was trying to achieve with my daily dose of acid and um uh ecstasy um this contact with something like bigger than myself, I get to have that now without this, uh, without a priest or acid having to do the interfacing with that for me. You know, that's like Catholics, we, we don't get to talk to God. We have to have the priest talk to God for us because uh, it's job security for them. Um, <laughs> So the fourth step, too, is, again, it's like I didn't have a big problem with that because I, at that point I did truly believe I was a piece of shit, and I was really looking forward to my sponsor confirming to me <laughs> that I was, in fact, the biggest piece of shit she'd ever met. Mm -hmm. um, probably too shitty even to live. Um, <laughs> and she didn't. She ate the biggest sandwich. She's a little lady, and she had this, like... <laughs> this massive sandwich that she was just eating the whole time. She's like, oh, yeah, I did that, too. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and it was just like these things that I carried around with me and then these all these things that I just made up because I was nervous. Um, <laughs> she treated so, not, not even cavalierly, but just like in a, we were, we were having a, a communion together, you know, she was really seeing me. I was being as honest as I was. it was possible for me to be at the time. Um, and being the good Catholic that I was, I would then was like, okay, so now it's time for me to become entirely ready and then um, give these character defects over. Oh, okay. And I waited, like, uh, for um, 
like a burning bush slash Moses cloud thing. And I was really bummed that nothing fucking happened. Um, I was like looking at a candle flame. I was like, maybe it'll wave a bit. None of that shit happened. Catholicism is way spookier and like way more dramatic sometimes than AA is. And I miss that about it. Um, more pageantry, um, more robes, more incense. Um, so recently I took a look at six and seven again. And for those of you who are brand new, like you'll get there. Um, uh, my character defects, you know, I was like, okay, I pray for them to be removed. It took until the last couple of years for me to be like, oh, I actually have to work beyond that if I want the results here. Because that's what's, that's where my life is right now at 11 years sober. It's like I've got the relationship with the higher power. I know how to do a 10 step. I know how to find my part. But I'm still kind of tripping over the same bullshit that I drank over, you know, like, I said something really stupid to somebody and now I'm obsessing about it. I said something like, you know, off color and it didn't land and they looked at me weird and now I'm like obsessing about it for like three days straight. Or, um, I got nervous in, uh, I got nervous in a meeting and, um, and swore or I cut some, you know, whatever it is. Um, those are the things that fuck with my mental, uh, with my serenity these days and that I'm, I'm really trying to get rid of. And so I read this AA book a few years ago, Drop the Rock. And if, if anyone hasn't read that book, it's awesome. It's AA approved literature about finding the opposite of the character defect that like the thing that you is the opposite of the defect and really actively trying to use that acting as if you already have it. So instead of being, um, <laughs> having bad confidence and seeking to be a people pleaser because you have such bad self-confidence acting as if you've already got this skill acting as if you're, um, uh, brave acting as if you have courage acting as if you're like a principled moral person, um, and actively stopping the thought when you're find that you're in your character defect. And that's been a, a total game changer in the last couple of years for me in order to address some of these alcoholic behaviors that I had um, that were still ruling my life. Um, and then I did nine. I made amends to people. It was actually so easy. Um, no, my family is so AA-phobic that all the amends that I was like, hey, you know, can I talk to you about something? Okay. They knew it was coming, and all of them without fail were like, we don't need your AA bullshit. You're fine. You're fine. You're fine. You're fine. Everything's fine. Everything's fine. <laughs> so I was like, okay, sweet. I'll just, like, do a living amends to you guys. I'll just pray for you or whatever. Um, and um, a lot of the other ones I made, people were not as um, – I wasn't as big of a piece of shit to them as I was – to myself in my own mind. I was kind of a legendary piece of shit in my own mind. And most people really didn't ever think about me um, <laughs> or remember these pip things that were pivotal to me. They were just like, oh, she's weird today, and then moved on and never thought about it again. <laughs> I have no doubt that if I had um, bred, if I had had children and tormented them with my drinking or had been married or was less of a, um isolator later in my drinking, I would have had more amends to make. Um, but, um, you know, I was, by the end of my drinking, I was mostly a, a weirdo who sat in my house and live blogged the people's court while sucking down whatever drugs I could find. So, um, you know, I didn't really have a lot of people to make amends to except myself. Whoa. Uh, uh, that's a little plot twist. Uh, several years in, I was like, Oh, why do I still hate myself? Well, it turns out that like a lot of the, um, a lot of the anger and frustration and damage that I had done was to me, uh, which is like uh, kind of a uh, a real, it makes me really sad to think about. Um, it seems kind of cheesy to say it, but it's also, I mean, there was so much self-harm and then there was so much harm that even after I got sober that I continued to do to myself and just how I thought about myself, how I talked about myself. Um, the way I let myself be treated for way too long. Um, and unpacking that in these last couple of years has been so rad. Um, the way uh, that I feel today about myself is the true, like, rich, like the, the cash and prizes of AA. 
Um, I'm really happy with who I am. Um, I had to really think today about my time drinking and using because I could not, uh, I hadn't really thought about it in the, in a 40 minute format detail in a really long time, which was so such a nice thing to realize because all the shame from that period of my life ruled me for so long. Um, it's what fueled me to keep drinking and keep harming myself and then to keep harming myself even after I got sober and, and, you know, to be free of that or mostly free of that at 11 years sober is amazing. Um, and then 10, what is 10? We do the 10. Yeah. The, the continue one, we do that. Um, there's a great 10 step meeting, um, in Oakland that some of us here go to and where we talk about the things that are continuing to, we're continuing to work on and to have the support of other people who are on the path to continue to grow is so fucking cool. Like the people that I work with, they don't have a fucking rule book that they follow on how to live. <laughs> They're just flailing. Um, I see the panic in their eyes of just like, Oh fuck, what do I do? You know, um, we're so lucky to have each other and other people who are on the path who talk our language, who can kind of inspire us to continue to grow and, um, be a, be better and help other people. 11, like I said, dude, I can fucking, I don't need drugs because I can lay, I have, I have a whole room in my house that's just Lara's little trip pad. Okay. I got a light show in there. I've got a bed of nails I lay on. I put masks on and then I got a, a bigger laser light mask that comes over my face and shoots LED rays into my skin. So I will stay forever young and beautiful because I am vain as fuck. I put on some music, okay? I put my legs up on a special pillow. I get the incense machine going. And I get in there, and I meditate, and I feel the woo-woos and shit, okay? I don't need drugs. Turns out, it's all in here the whole time, okay? Um, and then 12, work with other people. That's what it's all about. Um, that's how we stay sober. So I got to wrap it up. And so a little bit about what my life is like today. Um... I've had the same job for 10 years. I've been married for 10 years. Um, not the fucking uh, AA guys. <laughs> um, or I've been with my husband for 10 years. I have um, a lot of friends from AA that have been in my life the whole time, and I have a lot of intimacy with them. I know what I like and I know what I don't like. I know where my car is parked. I know uh, my phone. My phone isn't in the back of a taxi. Um and to me, uh, that is, that's all I get. And I'm just thrilled to pieces with it. So thanks. Thank you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.